All right, all right. We are getting started here five minutes early. So feel free to run to the bathroom or grab a snack if you want one. All right, it looks like we've got five eyes on. My name is Patty Dunn. I'm an environmental educator with the Schuylkill Center. And today I am reporting to you from my front porch. Environmental ed is a very different world these days. Typically we like to shy away from the digital stuff, but hey, we can also adapt. Uh, we like to talk about adaptations in the natural world and environmental educators can adapt too. So here we are. Um, I'm just going to mess around for a minute and see if I can check out comments and the like. Something I'm interested in at the moment, two things, how is my sound? Can you hear me? Um, and two, um, ages. I would love to know who I have tuning in. If it's mostly adults, I um, want to be able to make the content meaning for you. But if I've got some kids, I want to adjust my language as well. So. Um, torn whether to follow my watch time or my phone time. So we'll just give it another minute. I've got kind of a tour here. We're going to be talking about macro invertebrates. Um, so this is the main sample we'll be working with. I do not know how to prompt my phone to focus, but you can see a little bit of life going on in there. Yeah, I can even stick in my pipette, pipette give it a little stir. Wake them up. We're looking specifically at bentho macroinvertebrates, and so they like to stay on the bottom. Got a couple guys there. Oh, nice. So, all right, I'm gonna just check the time. Ooh, adult in Buckingham. Welcome, Audrey. Thanks for tuning in. I'm gonna slide out of view for a second just to check the time. All right, my computer says 8.28, so I'll just give that a second. You know we mean business when we go put the hair up. So Audrey, have you been to the Schuylkill Center before? I don't know where Buckingham is, so I'm not sure how, what that drive would be like. Oh, Valley Forge. We've got Valley Forge as well. Andrea, welcome, welcome. All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started with my intro. My name is Patty Dunn. I'm an environmental educator based in Philadelphia, and I work at the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. And so these days we are bringing our traditional on-site programs to the virtual world. And so this is part of our Schuylkill Saturday program in a non-COVID world. Um, visitors can come to our center and uh, we have family-based Saturday programming that follows a topic. Um, so we're just gonna uh, turn this into a live video and take our topics um, to our personal spaces. So this is my porch. Um, so, all right, Audrey, I hope we can see you, see you soon once things open up. Our trails are open right now. Our visitor center is closed, um, but in the yellow phase, um, we are comfortable having folks um, appropriately social distancing, wearing masks, things like that. But you can absolutely come get a respite from uh, the craziness of life and enjoy our trails. Um, so we'd love to have you if you're able to come out. Um, so that's it. Why don't we get started? Here we go. So um, what are macroinvertebrates? I've chosen this topic because it's something that you can learn about pretty much anywhere in the world as long as you have a water source. Um, and macros can live in streams, lakes, creeks, ponds, all of it. Um, so what is a macroinvertebrate? Well, it is a, an animal without a backbone that is large enough to be seen with the naked eye. So when you think macro, don't think 
you know, giant think, oh, I can actually see that. I don't need a microscope. Um, and so these are really important organisms to study because they're a huge part of the ecosystem that they live in. Specifically, they play a really key role in the food web. So when we think about food webs or food chains, we think about those those bottom organisms, the producers, they make their own food, things like algae or leaves. They're the ones who provide the energy at the bottom of that chain. Um, and then we have the larger consumers that can't produce their own food. They need to eat something in order to get that energy. And so we find macros somewhere in the middle. So they do play this really important role. Um, but another reason we love to look at them and study them is because they are what's considered um, a water quality indicator. And what this means is that by studying them, we can infer something about the quality of the water where we found them. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit at the end when we talk about um, identification. Um, but the reason that we can learn about the quality of the water is because macros have a range of sensitivity to pollutants. Um, so we break them up into um, tolerant, which means they can handle pollution, um, moderately sensitive, which means they have some sensitivity, but they're not, um, uh, you know, it's, it's moderate not extreme um, and then we have uh, <laughs> and then we have um, oh my goodness sorry I'm losing your track we've got tolerant moderately sensitive and sensitive there we go um, and so um, how do we find these well this is the fun part um, like I said you can find them in pretty much any water body um, even a puddle you could probably find some mosquito larva we know about that um, but the tools you need are very simple and so this is a really accessible activity um, so this is the net that I used. Um, I literally bought this at the dollar store. We would call this style a dip net. It has a flat bottom. This is nice because you can stick it down to kind of the bottom of the stream or the water body that you're sampling in. Um, and then a jar. Um, I use these large glass jars. Glass is nice just because it's inert and um, it's hardy. Um, don't drop it, but um, it's a great, you know, have it on hand, a ball mason jar, whatever you want. Um, and so that's really all you need. And of course, some hand sanitizer I've got here, um, because especially if you're sampling in a developed area or an urban area, we know that our streams um, are compromised with pollution. So we always wanna be really careful to sanitize um, after we play in a creek or do sampling in a creek. So um, that's how you're gonna do your sampling. Um, and then as you look at your jar, you can kind of start out right away making observations. What do I see that's living? What looks like it's dead? What looks like it was never living? It's abiotic. Um, you can really study your sample. Um, you also want to be thoughtful about the site where you sampled. Um, what was the river or water body like? What were the plants in the area like? What was the weather on that day? If I had a thermometer, I would have tested the temperature of the water. Um, I didn't have a thermometer today, but when I stuck my hands in, it felt warm to the touch. And so that kind of stood out to me. Okay, I wonder how this is going to impact my sample um, with the water being a little bit warmer. Typically, that means that there's less dissolved oxygen oxygen, which is not as great for these organisms. Um, but again, I, I wasn't able to actually read the, the water temperature, so I don't know that for sure. Um, but in terms of the specific site where you want to do your sampling, um, I can give you a few tips on what to look for. Again, this applies to a stream or a river, not necessarily a lake or a pond. Um, but when we're sampling in a stream, I like to sample for the benthic um, macroinvertebrates, the ones that are sort of bottom dwelling. Uh, they like to cling to rocks and things like that. Um, even in my jar here, I can see them clinging to the sides. That's sort of their mechanism. Hold tight, stay, stay put, and uh, let the food come to you kind of a mentality. Um, so you want to look for what's called a riffle. Now, a riffle is a shallow area in the stream where the water is really rushing over the rocks pretty quickly. Um, and the reason this is important is because as the water rushes and um, the air gets mixed in, we have waves and bubbles going on that infuses the water with dissolved oxygen, which as I just mentioned is essential. Um, just like oxygen is essential to us, it's essential to all living, um, living animals. And so that's where we will find it. All right, I'm just going to turn my notes here. Um, 
And so once you've done your sampling, what you wanna do is start to identify them. Um, and you don't need to be an expert to do this. I love macros, but I am by no means an expert. I'm familiar with some of our most common um, in macroinvertebrates that we have, but um, even people who are familiar are gonna need to um, use the aid of some type of tool. So this is called a dichotomous key. And if you're not familiar, a dichotomous key is simply a key that helps um, uses questions and sort of branching off into usually two two or three categories to help you slowly get closer and closer to your identification so for example i'll link to this after we're done i'll put this in the comments a uh, digital um, link to this um, but for example the first question is shell or no shell that's an easy one if it's got a shell you're going to come over here and you're going to look at um single shell or double shell um, the perfect the pictures are super helpful they're not the, the size is not um, relative they had to sort of squish them all on the paper so you can't necessarily view by size um, but the questions are super helpful um, and so you're gonna be the questions are gonna pertain to things like how many legs does it have how many sets of legs does it have does it have wings or no does it have any tails or no if tails how many um, and so that's how you kind of narrow your way down to actually being able to identify something. Um, so as you pull out your sample, you're gonna be identifying them. Um, when I was college, we liked to do this using an ice cube tray. You would put all of your scuds here, all your uh, caddis fly larvae over here and categorize them. So then you know the diversity of species you have. How many different species do I have here? Um, do I have a lot of one particular species? Is something kind of rare, is something particularly common? Um, so once we identify them, we can and start to sort of pull them apart figuratively um, and learn a little bit more um, and then like I mentioned at the beginning we know that macros are an indicate can indicate something about the water quality and so we can say okay of the macro invertebrates that I have which ones are sensitive to pollution which ones are moderately sensitive and do I have any that are um, intolerant um, now it's interesting you might think so the healthiest river in the world would have only macros that are super intolerant because those are the best. Um, but the reality is we're looking for diversity. We want to see a range of different organisms. Um, we want to see those leeches and those worms in a healthy level. We don't want to only see them. We don't want to see an overabundance of them, but we do want them present along with all the other species in there. So um, this is a beginner's protocol picture key they call it um, but I'll show it um, so up here we have macros that um, reflect an excellent or good water quality and then move down here I'm hoping it flips the image for you so the words aren't backwards um, but this these organisms could be present in a wide range of water qualities and then when we come down even to the bottom, um, these are those guys I was just talking about. Um, they can be present in fair to poor quality um, water. And so uh, obviously this is simplified and summarized, but can be really helpful in looking at your sample and saying, well, what do I have? Um, so that's kind of the process. Um, we, we want to get a good sample size we don't want to just have three organisms that we're looking at um, and then as we categorize them we start to peel back the layers and learn more about um, the larger picture of that body of water um, so i don't think i mentioned at the beginning but now that we're going to get into my specific sample i guess this is a good time to talk about it so again i said i got this sample this morning um, and I live in Germantown, so I just scooted over to the Wissahickon, and specifically I was at Kitchens Lane. If, you're, if you live in the Northwest, you're probably familiar with Kitchens Lane. Um, it's a great spot, but it's a spot where there's a bend in the river and there's a really nice, pretty wide riffle. And so I took this sample um, from the Wissahickon, and I see, oh, I really wish I could tell how focused that was. I don't think it is that focused. Um, and immediately when I was sampling, I noticed um, how warm the water was, and I noticed that I wasn't seeing a lot of different organisms. I was mostly seeing um, a crustacean called the scud, which coincidentally is my favorite macro for no other reason than it's super cute. Um, 
but I wasn't very happy with that. So I actually moved a little bit upstream to a, um, an offshoot, uh, a smaller stream that had sort of a confluence right there. I don't know what it is. Oh shoot, I was gonna figure that out before I started the live. Um, but it's much more narrow, it's shaded, it has a really robust riparian buffer. That planted area along the sides of the stream was really healthy and thriving. And even just sticking my hands in, I could tell this water is cooler. Um, so that's where I got, oh shoot, did I just mix them up? No, I got this one. Um, and you might not be able to tell from just peeking at the jar, um, but I could tell right away, oh, I don't know if you can see right here, that is a leech. Um, a lot of the thing that you see kind of scudding around is that scud. Um, and then there are other organisms hiding down here in the detritus, the decaying organic matter. So this is the fun part. I am keeping an eye on comments. So if you have something specific, feel free to um, shoot it in. Again, I'm not a I'm not an expert. I am just a, um, an enthusiast and, and a naturalist. So, um, so I can't promise I can answer your questions, but that's the fun about environmental ed. We're always learning together. There's, you can never stop learning about the natural world. There is just way too much to learn and so much that, um, even the experts are continuing to learn. So that's my out. Um, but I am going to go ahead and move the camera turn it around so if it feels jostled just bear with me for a minute um, and what I'm gonna do is show you a petri dish of organisms that I pulled out um, to save us some time um, and then I'm going to do my best to move a few of them to my microscope so that should be fun uh, just give me a second here oh ignore the construction stuff on my lap my uh, porch okay so here is the petri dish and again kind of a bird's eye view here on my actual larger sample you can sort of indistinctly see things moving around um, but once you pull them out you can get a little bit of a better sense um, so i don't want to i don't want to name anything quite yet because i want to be able to use the dichotomous key and to do that we'll look at um under the microscope to get a better look. Now, again, these are macro invertebrates, so we can see them with the naked eye. Here's my finger just to give you a sense of scale, um, but everything's fun when you can see it closer up. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna set the camera here for a second. No, yep, we'll do it here. Um, and I'm using my Brock magic scope. I've actually had this since childhood. My parents are awesome and bought it for me once they realized that I was interested in uh, the natural sciences. So I've had it since I was a kid. And the thing that I really like about it is um, that it doesn't require any electricity, batteries, anything like that. So this is the piece. I'm not sure what it's um, this specific style is called, but it just uses sunlight. And even here on my shaded porch is plenty of light to um, make it work. Um, but then it actually has um, true lenses. We have our optic lens and our, um, ugh, there it goes, out of my brain, the second lens here. So it is a true compound microscope combining those two lenses. Um, up here we have um, a five times magnification and down here it's four. So our view that I'll, I'll give you through the phone is going to be 20 times magnified. Um, so I have one depression slide, which to be completely honest, I think I long-term borrowed from my high school. Sorry. Um, and I set it right here. Um, so again, pretty basic scientific tool. I've got a pipette, uh, woo, an eyedropper essentially. Um, and I'm going to pull off why don't we pull off that one that I said was my favorite? Do some forceps. He's gonna actually, he might be a little too wiggly. I'm resisting using my fingers because I'm trying to show proper uh, protocol. All right, let's go with this guy. Ah. All right, we're gonna have to adjust So, as you can see, come over, give them a little water. The depression slide is different than a normal, just flat microscope slide because it has like, almost looks like a contact lens, a little pool, so it can hold the water, hold the sample. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and focus in. 
Again, we've got 20 times magnification right here. And I'm gonna focus in, he's kind of curled up in sort of a fetal position. So I'm gonna go ahead and, um, uh, fun fact about the way Sahagin related to natural sciences. Ooh, I'll get to that in a second. Oh, you're moving, he's waking up. All right, so we'll go for the head. Ooh, and another specimen crawled in. So I'm gonna flip this around and there you go. Now you can see that sort of uh, wiggly thing in what would be kind of his armpit there. Um, that is a separate macro that we can identify. Um, but you can see sort of the dark color on his back. Ooh, that's called the Lamardo. The bottom lens, oh, is the objective. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for the help. Um, I'm gonna move it so we can look at the tail because that's another feature that we're often looking at to help us identify. Oh, that's perfect. I hope he doesn't move. There we go. Um, and these features are really important as we then move to the dichotomous key. There you go. So we can see it has two tails uh, and he's moving. So it's going in and out of focus. Um, and again, we can see that other organism attached there. So let's look at that for a second. We're gonna come right on over to our dichotomous key. Again, it starts at the top, shell, no shell, no legs, legs. We're gonna come down here. It's kind of like a little maze, 10 plus legs or three pairs of legs. Um, and then wings or no wings. We're gonna come over here to no wings. And here we go, uh, no obvious tails. Um, and here we have one or two tails. Um, and then over here is three. So we've got our two tails. Um, so I am, oh, this is interesting. So I'm thinking caddisfly larva because again, it has that dark sort of armor up at the top. It's got the legs of the two tails and they, they kind of show the detail of, um, I almost call them furry. This is how you know I'm not a, a, a true uh, <laughs> expert. I'd have a better word than furry there. Um, but I believe that's who it is, caddisfly. And there are different, um, there are different species even within the caddisfly. Like you can have a filtering caddisfly. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch. Seems like people enjoy this. So I'm not the only, I don't even need to say nerd. That's a, that's derogatory. This is awesome. We're the only, uh, I'm not the only one who's, who's into this. All right, so let's try. All right, I'm breaking the rules. I'm gonna go ahead and grab this scud with my hands. Try to at least. Oh, I realized we didn't, um, shoot, we didn't identify that other one. I think I know what it is, but I don't want to speak until I actually have a little more confidence because I don't want to give misinformation. All right, we've got our scud. Now these guys are wiggly, so I'm a little, we'll see if they, I'm able to get a good focus. I want to give him enough water to be happy, but not so much that he, um, Susan LJ, Memories of Environmental Science class. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So let me focus here. Oh, he's not happy with me. So I'll only do this one for a moment. So there we go, this is the scud. Um, and the other thing that's interesting, I need to learn more about this, but th one of the things I enjoy about the macroinvertebrates is that you can really see a lot of their um, internal organs. You can see their exoskeletons. You can see their, um, yeah, you can see the stuff going on internally. Um, and I just feel like that's really neat, especially for kids. Um, you know, it's nice to talk about like human anatomy and things like that. That's important. But when you can really see, um, you know, the gills move in, the legs move in, the antennae, the eye, the digestive tract, um, I feel like that's pretty neat. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, um, I think I told you that one, that one's just this good. We could have gone through our dichotomous key. We would have seen 10 plus legs, which are mostly crustaceans and arachnids, um, over in that category. He's happy to be back in there. Um, and I'm going to move to a smaller organism because I want to show you how I can switch out my lenses. Um, 1045. Um, so, don't stop me with that. Ooh, 
blue eye. Wonder. Hmm. All right, we'll stick with the original plan. I'm going to try to isolate that one organism that we saw hanging on to the caddisfly larva. Um, ah, where'd you go? I think this was it. Okay, so again, we're starting out with our 20% magnification. feel a little bad trapping these guys on the slides, but I try to put them back before they get too uh, stressed out. There we go. Uh, don't run away. Um, but you can see the two tails. I apologize, this one's a little more shaky than the last one. You can see the three sets of legs um, and a pretty simple body. So as I come here again, we're looking at the um, legs, we're looking at um, three pairs of legs. We're looking at no wings. Um, well, let's see, because that really looked like two tails, but I was thinking it was something different. Yes, two tails. So I wonder, because originally I was thinking riffle beetle. Um, here we have the caddisfly larva. That looks like it has two tails. See, this is where I get to the point where I'm, I need to do more learning. Um, and that's fine. Um, so I am going, it's definitely a larva. We can say that. Um, and I wonder if it, see we, right here, we have two, two different caddisfly larvas. It's not this one. This one was much larger. Um, we saw them under the microscope together. We could see that this one was significantly larger than this one. I do think it's this one, and I'll just need to learn a little bit more why those aren't considered quote-unquote tails. I've also noticed that tails is in quotes, so these aren't true tails. Um, so I'll, I'll, I want to learn more about what makes them not real and what differentiates those two um, appendages from something over here. Perhaps it's those hairs. All right, so you are being so patient with my... Um, <sighs> Hi, Aaliyah. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and switch those lenses. So first I'm just gonna do the easy one. I'm gonna take off my five times magnification um, eyepiece and switch it to um, 10 times. So we're gonna pop on here. I'm gonna make sure it is... Mm -hmm. Ooh. Oh, I feel bad. He's really trying to run away. Actually, before I show you, I want to take out a little bit more of the water because once you get a closer magnification, um, the movement is really, um, even the tiniest movement appears to be much more extreme and they can much more easily go out of focus or out of view. So I just want you to be able to see it. So um, let's try again. Mm, he moved. There we go. So this one is 40 times larger than in real life. You can also see that this lens is dirtier, so I apologize for that. I do not have any lens paper. Um, and let's see if we can get a different part of the body. How about those non-tails down at the bottom? There you go. Oh my gosh, Dennis Brock, the inventor of the Magiscope, is watching. He's from Philly. Ah, that's insane. Oh, I'll have to connect. Um, like I said, I, I probably got this Magiscope in like, I don't know, 1998. Is that possible? Um, so do folks want to see one more? I think we have some more time if anybody is interested. Um, let me see if I can find an even smaller organism. The smaller they get, the, the worse I am with identification. I'm really like putting myself on blast right now, but I am all about honesty. Um, but I think seeing something even smaller might be neat. Um, or, okay, this leech is actually pretty cool. Leeches can be hard to look at because uh, they do move quite easily. But we can switch to a leech for a second. Oh man, he's just gonna come right off my slide. No, that's not gonna work. Sorry, guys. Um, 
Now something that would be neat to see that's not um, not looking at macroinvertebrates, but looking again at that larger food chain is um, looking at the different types of algae, um, the diatoms, um, those can be really neat. You do need a better microscope to be able to view some of those. Um, I'm gonna bring you over here to see my sample. Now that it's been sitting for a minute, it's pretty, pretty active and happy. We've got this leech. We've got the scuds. Um, over here we have, looks like, um, oh, that's another scud. It's kind of on his side. Um, now specifically, ooh, okay. I'm not gonna be able to get him out because I don't have the right tools to dig that far down and not cause too much disruption. So we can bring it over here. Can you see this? Um, looks almost like a, a caterpillar, an underwater caterpillar right there. I can't zoom. Um, but that, oh, I wonder if we could identify that. Let's come over here. Back to our key. Um, so we're going to go no legs on him. Um, obviously I can't pull him out. We can't verify that, but I'm pretty sure he has no legs. Um, and this says with tentacle bushers or tails. Shoot. I wish I could pull him out. All right. We're going to have to do a second round on this for another Google Saturday. Um, my, my guess, and this is a guess, is a crane fly larva. Um, Maybe this is a good time to pop over to another resource that I always recommend. This book is called Pond Life. Um, it's a really nice pocket guide. Um, it goes through a lot of good introductory stuff, talking about um, kind of overall landscapes and ecosystems. It does focus on ponds, not so much rivers, um, ponds and lakes. Um, talks about the different areas. It talks about um, the chemistry that's going on, the dissolved oxygen, the different nutrients, um, the different, what's going on, the different layer, the different, you know, stratus, stratospheres um, within the lake. Um, and then it gets into good idea. And the reason I like it is because it has um, terrestrial plants, aquatic plants, microscopic, you know, the algae. Um, and um, you need a photo adapter. <laughs> I'll get that. Um, and then to um, the microscopic organisms looking at, um, you know, like the Daphnia. Here we go. Um, these are the, this page is for crustaceans. So this is the scud that we were looking at. I kept an eye out for crayfish, but I didn't see any. I wasn't looking that hard. Um, then we can come over, look at some copepods. Again, these are more on the microscopic end, um, but all of our different larvae. I don't think I found any of these, the mayfly and cranefly larvae. I mean, oh, we do think we saw maybe a cranefly larva, um, but not, not this stage, the three-tailed um, that looks a little bit more like a traditional insect you would think about. I don't, I don't think I saw any of those. Um, and then even coming up for those food chain fish, um, amphibians, reptiles, might even have some birds in here. Um, yeah. So this is a great resource. Um, the reason I pulled that out is because I was going to look for that, what I think might be a crane fly larva. Ugh, again, it's just hard to say um, since I can't pull it out. Um, I need a bucket or like a turkey baster. <laughs> My pipette is not cutting it. But anyway, so this, that's the basic gist. That's mostly what I have for you today. I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer, answer any questions. I'm going to look a little bit more carefully through the comments. I think it was mostly social stuff, which I love. Um, but in case there are any questions. Um, also specifically bringing it back to the Schuylkill Center, there are so many places that you can look for macroinvertebrates um, on site. We have several different ponds. Um, oh, shoot. I made a list and I forgot it. Um, the other piece that I decided not to mention is that I'm very new to the Google Center, so I haven't even had that much time on site before the lockdown happened, so I'm still getting familiar with the names of all the ponds, um, but I know that there are several ponds. We, um, You can bring your own net on happier days when our center is open. You can probably even borrow a net um, and a tub, um, and this is really fun. I have two children myself, ages seven and five. This is something we really enjoy doing. Um, it just kind of helps kids get below that leg 
fire. You know, sometimes you can see turtles, sometimes you can see birds, you know, you can see the plants that are growing. Um, but I feel like to help kids sort of open up their minds thinking, you know, it even goes deeper than that. The layers get, um, you know, wider and wider. There's so much going on that doesn't meet the eye. Um, and so being able to help them kind of do that own investigation for themselves, pulling it out and saying, oh, I didn't even see those in there. Seeing the water beetles or the water striders, that's always really fun. So um, I really long to be back on site. I hope this was fun sort of in the meantime. Um, I'm going to keep looking at the samples. I'm going to see if I can pull out He's coming up. I think I might be able to reach him, but I want to respect your time. Um, and so again, I'll stay on, but I am going to say goodbye to the general audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and I can't wait to see you back on site soon enough. Take care, get outside and enjoy. <laughs>
The brownish to whitish aquatic larva can be recognized by the disc at the end of their tail. This disc, which has tube-like spiracles, is thrust, oh, they're talking about mating. Okay, we don't need to hear all about that. Um, about 30 species of North American crane flies are aquatic. Among the most widely distributed are the species Tipula. Their large, tough skin larvae, sometimes called leather jackets, live in mats of algae and other vegetation in the sandy or muddy bottoms of lakes and ponds, in wet grass, or in debris of lowland shores. Species of Helias live in rich mud and on floating vegetation in marshes, especially in water where emergent plants are abundant. Here's a picture. I need that book and that diagram. I got this book, I won't tell you where I bought it because I'm ashamed, um, but I bought it um, because I knew I, I wanted to have it in my personal stock um, while we do this virtual programming. Um, I think it was $7, but I recommend that you buy it from your local bookstore. I didn't, but I should have. Um, okay, I'm gonna do my best to look through comments. This is so cumbersome on the phone. Hmm. Let's go. I love to hear your favorite tidbit fun fact about the Wissahickon related to natural sciences. Well, my favorite thing about talking about the nature sciences, natural sciences in Philadelphia is the tie between the history and the natural uh, world and the way that they have evolved and kind of had this give and take over time. And so I really love learning about the history of things that happened in the Wissahickon or nearby areas like along the Schuylkill River, um, thinking about how what was going on, for example, in Maniunk as this major textile industry impacted the waterways. And then as we became less industrialized as a city and tried to put more of an emphasis on water quality. You know, city of Philadelphia had this terrible reputation for the smell of our rivers. I mean, there are people who've lived in Philly long enough to remember the days when you could smell the Schuylkill and the Delaware. Um, and so seeing how um, there's been this um, healing in the natural space, and obviously there's a ton of work to go. Um, the Wissahickon in particular receives a lot of effluent from upstream wastewater treatment plants and so often this water is technically cleaner than the river itself but that's like another piece of this natural flowing water body is so integrally tied to uh, the humans that live around it. You know, streams are um, just one part of the larger watershed that feeds it. Um, that's why I get really defensive when people talk poorly about the Schuylkill. I know this is like a major nerdy thing about me, but when people are like, oh, Schuylkill, so gross. How could you be near that? That thing is disgusting. As if they're shaming the river and not the people who are responsible for putting it in the state it is. Um, the Schuylkill and the Delaware are both really far downstream from many large um, developed areas upstream, all of which are are contributing to the degradation of these rivers. And um, so the fact that they're as healthy as they are these days, I think, is great. I think there's more work to go. I think. Um, it is a neat way to study our city's history or early American into modern day history is by looking at the story that our rivers have to tell. Um, and so when I think of the Wissahickon specifically, I'm thinking, well, what used to happen here? What did it look like initially? What was it like when the Lenape people were here? How were they using these streams? What were the species present when they were there? Um, you know, did Shad come all the way up the Wissahickon? What was that like? Um, you know, how bad did it get? Did the Wissahickon essentially die the same way the Schuylkill and the Delaware essentially died? Um, these are all questions I have and that's when I really love hiking around and seeing the dilapidated walls and thinking, well, what was this? Was this part of a mill? Was it part of a farm? Was this land farmed? Was this land preserved? Which pieces have been undisturbed for the longest? Which pieces are most native? Um, so that's where I like to focus. Um, thank you, Kyle, for that question. I don't know if it really answered it, but that's what I do when I hike with my family. Um, someone helping me out with the objective lens. Um, and I can even go smaller. Again, I'm, I, like, I'm just a fan of the Brock Magiscope. Um, we can go much closer magnification. I didn't want to go all the way in because I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to keep the phone steady for all of that. But um, it's a great, it's a great piece of equipment if you can um, 
save the funds to grab one and it will last you literally forever. Um, excellent, excellent. 1107, I am past time. Hi, Dennis, that was so exciting. I'm gonna have to reach out to the Brock family. Um, that was really neat to have them on the call. All right, I gotta use that coffee filter trick next time I wanna isolate some specimens. This is so neat learning in, in a community like this. I'm typically with kids, uh, so it's neat to be able to learn from adults. That book and that diagram, I'll link to resources. Oh, I forgot to mention, I have a take home activity. Um, it is geared more towards children, but hey, if adult wants to try it, it's actually really fun. I enjoyed putting the lesson together, but it's um, walking you through creating your own dichotomous key to something that you're interested in, um, something you're an expert in. So you can use something natural, plants, insects, rocks, something from your yard, but you can also use something totally not related to the natural sciences like kitchen utensils or your stuffed animals which is what I used for my example. I asked my kids to each bring down five stuffed animals and then we created a dichotomous key looking at comparing the features so we can break them up into different. Um, Dennis is from Mount Airy. I'm in Germantown but I'm really close to Mount Airy. This is so exciting. Um, so anyway, I will link to, um, I will link to the dichotomous key I referenced. I will link to this smaller, um, indicator breaking them up by pollution tolerance. I will link to that take home activity, making your own dichotomous key. Um, and I will link to the Stroud, um, research center cause they really have some great, um, online resources, a great key, uh, like a virtual key that essentially walks you through the same way a, a paper dichotomous key would um, but it's cooler when it's virtual and they have actual pictures um, so I will throw those links in now when I switch over to my laptop but again thank you so much for joining uh, and tune in next week for more Google Saturdays take care y'all be well